Well, hello and welcome to Roundabout Books Thursday Night Author Series. We are joined tonight by Sarah Dykeman and her book, Bicycling with Butterflies. My name is Julie and I'm the events manager at Roundabout Books. If you haven't been able to stop into the store recently, um, we invite you to do so. We are open Monday through Thursday, 10 to 6, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, 10 to 5. We do have some in-person events coming up soon, uh, including two in November that will be uh, both local authors, one with a uh, book about hiking the Columbia Gorge and Mount Hood, and another fiction book that takes place on the Oregon coast. So please check out our uh, events calendar on our website for that. I want to take this time to remind everyone as we're talking about books, as we're talking about getting into um, the colder months and what those bring in holiday shopping, reminding everyone that buying early for holiday gifts is really recommended right now. We are seeing some supply chain issues, but we will always do our best to get you the book that you're looking for. And if you come in looking for a specific book and we cannot get it, one of our booksellers will find you a book that will meet all of your needs. That's what we're here for. So as I said, we're going to talk tonight about bicycling with butterflies. So Sarah is joining us tonight from California. So thank you so much and everyone who is here on this event. Uh, if you know someone who would want to uh, know about this book and couldn't make it to the event tonight, please check our YouTube channel. We are, are putting all of our recordings of our Zoom events up there for posterity. Um, so let's get started with our event. So as the title of the book, uh, specifies, Sarah did this 10,000 miles journey on a bike cobbled together from different parts. So Sarah is an outdoor educator and field researcher in bicycling, bicycle, excuse me, with butterflies. Sarah recounts her incredible journey and the dramatic ups and downs of the nearly nine month odyssey. And obviously doing this before COVID, you know, we can maybe talk about what it would have been like having to do it a different time. But um, beyond that, uh, Sarah is the founder of beyondabook.org, which fosters lifelong learners, boundary pushers, explorers, and stewards. She works in amphibian research and as an outdoor educator, guiding young people into nature so they can delight in its complicated brilliance. Sarah, I know one of the reasons that we scheduled this event when we did was because you were doing some stuff with uh, amphibian research, correct? Right, yeah, I just yeah. finished up a, a summer of amphibian work in the Sierra in California. That is so cool. Well, I'm gonna turn it over to you because I am just as excited as everyone who's joining us tonight to hear more about bicycling with butterflies. Awesome, well. Um, I'm happy to be here and thanks for the invitation and thanks to everyone for, for logging on and taking some time to hear about my trip and the, and the Monarch. I, I did this trip back in 2017 and before I, before I took or went a mile, like I, my goal was to, to learn about Monarchs and to be their voice. And I have no idea where that was going to take me, but but when I started pedaling, it was like, I didn't have a lot, of, a lot of plans. I didn't have a lot of contacts, but I thought, all right, I'm gonna ride with the Monarchs and I'm basically gonna be a publicity stunt. And I'm gonna say, hey, look, I'm doing this crazy trip. And then when people were looking, I'd sneak in facts about Monarchs and how people could help. And what kind of is amazing is that I continued to get to use my voice. And by, by writing a book, I've gotten to reach thousands of more people and it's it's been a real pleasure and and yeah so like tonight this is part of my my goal and my dream was to is to talk about monarchs so thanks to everyone for letting letting me do so um i will share my screen so we can see some photos what my plan is tonight is to go is to spend a little bit of time on monarch ecology a little bit of time on what bike touring is all about and then how people can help with the monarch migration. And if people have any questions or they think of ones before, uh, throw them in the chat and I, I'm not gonna talk the, the whole hour so we'll have plenty of time to, to get to questions. So I, I love questions, don't be scared. The harder, weirder the question, the better, so bring them on. But anyway, um, just in case there's someone out there that doesn't know, this is a monarch butterfly. 
Um, you can tell this is a male because of these scent glands on, on his wing. And he's actually nectaring right now on a swamp milkweed plant. And for folks that don't know, the monarch and the milkweed are, are soulmates. They, they are they're part of the same story. So the, the milkweed is the only food source of the monarch caterpillar. And the milkweed is toxic to most herbivores, but the monarchs can actually, will actually lay their eggs only on milkweed. The caterpillars will, or their, the eggs will hatch into caterpillars and the caterpillars will eat exclusively milkweed and they'll actually sequester the toxins in their bodies and that's what gives monarchs their protection and the orange coloring is a warning to predators saying look out when i was a caterpillar i, I ate poison and now i'm poisonous so it's a really amazing story um milkweed is i think one of the most beautiful plants i describe them often as shooting stars they just they're just so beautiful and i'm so i'm so happy that i'm asking people to plant a beautiful plant and that's really what this presentation boils down to is i'm asking people to plant milkweed and I'm, I can jump all over the place. I, I kind of like, it's like a bike ride. Like I see a little detour and I'm like, oh, let's go down that. But for now, I'll just, I'll leave it with that. And if we, if people have questions about more details, we'll get to them later. So a little bit more about the monarch ecology is this is their range map. And it's basically color coded by season. The yellow is where the monarchs live in the summer. The green is where they live in the spring orange is fall and then you'll see a few blue dots and that is their winter range and you can see that their summer range is massive and their winter range is much much smaller which is why when you see pictures of monarchs say in michoacan in mexico which is where most the majority of the monarchs overwinter they're in these dense clusters and i have a photo later on but it's it's really breathtaking and amazing but i do want to especially since we're since uh, roundabout is in, in Bend, Oregon. I want to uh, point out that we do have monarchs out west as well. Um, the, the populations are divided by the Rocky Mountains and we typically you'll hear folks say the eastern population and the western population. That's kind of a misnomer because they're genetically not different so they're they are the same population. It's more like a group but that's a little a little nomenclature issue but you can see that they overwinter on the coast of California and you've probably heard in the news about the, the Western monarch population decline. I, I have a graph here in a bit. Um, it's not looking super bright, but it's not over yet. And I think one of the great things about the monarch is that when, when we for, focus on the monarch, when we protect the monarch, we end up protecting a lot. So even if we don't see a monarch in our yard this year, if we have native plants, we're, we're helping animals that maybe aren't as quote newsworthy or don't get quite as much of attention. So. That's a, a little uh, PSA. And since we have someone from Florida, there's also overwintering monarchs that might be going to Florida. It's a little complicated. Um, essentially, the monarchs that hit the eastern seaboard, oftentimes they'll follow the coast towards Mexico, but they'll kind of get confused in Florida. And it depends on the season. Some seasons in Florida, the temperature is mild enough that they'll survive. But often there'll be a cold snap for a week or so that will, will kill these monarchs. Um, and so it's it's obviously changing with climate change. There's still a lot of unknowns, that, hence the question mark right there. But um, interesting things to be watching for over the next the next decade or so to see what see what happens. But anyway, um, I'm going to focus mostly on the eastern monarchs here. I started in Michoacan. Here's my route actually. I started in Michoacan in mid March or early March of 2017, and I. Um, went north doing a lot of zigzags. Basically every zigzag you see is when someone would send me an email saying, hey, I live in Rochester or I live in, in wherever. Um, and I'd say, oh, I'd look and I'd be like, okay, I need this much time to get there. Okay, yeah, I can do that. And I really did try and say yes to invitations as much as possible. So every zigzag is pretty much me saying yes as, as best as I could. And then I headed back south in the fall. You'll see this stop here I did twice. That's because that's where I'm from. I'm from Kansas City, so I stayed with my parents twice. And I arrived back to Michoacan in late November. So most of the monarchs are arriving right about now. Um, they usually arrive around the very beginning of November, which is Dia de los Muertos, Day of the Dead, which is um, pretty, pretty exciting. I was with the stragglers. So when I was in Mexico, I was seeing monarchs every day or so. 
but we, we were at the tail end of things and um, I'm not ashamed to admit I'm slower than a butterfly. But then I always say I'm slower than a butterfly, but faster than a caterpillar. So something to be proud of. As far as what bike touring is, this is kind of what bike touring is. This is my setup here. Um, and by the way, that's a bunch of common milkweed behind me. Common milkweed is my favorite. Feel, every time I see them, I feel like I'm saying hi to a friend. They're so awesome. But on my bike, my bike is this old beat up mountain bike. Nothing special, only cost a few hundred dollars. I think it's important to recognize that you don't need the fanciest gear. You just need comfortable stuff that will get you through. And then on my front, I have panniers. These are store-bought panniers. They, they house like more things I really, really wanted to make sure didn't get wet, um, like my sleeping bag, sleeping pad, my computer, my journal, stuff like that. And then in the back here, I've got the tools on the outside. I have a tent is in the red bag and the blue thing is a little camp chair. And then I had, I usually would have about one day's worth of food and then like my rain gear, random stuff. I had a, I had, I, ca I carry too much stuff. You don't need all this, obviously. I was on, I was on the road for nine months. So I brought things that maybe other people wouldn't have brought. Like I brought an art set and a tripod and, and, and unnecessary things, but I didn't have to go fast. I had all day to bike and I only went about 60 miles a day. So having, carrying a little bit more and going a little bit slower was, was doable. Now, what it, there's a lot of different ways to bike tour. The way, the reason I love this way so much and the way that I, I went is because I really didn't need to have a really thought out plan. Because I had everything I needed, I, I could kind of just go with the flow and figure out things as I went along and change my plans when I would meet someone at a grocery store, when I'd get an email from someone. And so it was a lot of like flying by the seat of the pants, making decisions in the spur of the moment. Um, but, but that really is what I love. It, it really just gives you a, a really great sense of freedom. And, and so, like I, I was saying, I would, I was able to just eat whenever I was hungry. I didn't actually camp or cook all that much. This is my little cooking setup for, for like a hot meal. I ended up just mostly eating sandwiches. I, I think I write in my book about my famous salad sandwich, which is a piece of bread, a lot of lettuce, sesame seed or sesame seeds, sunflower seeds, salad dressing, more bread squished together. That's that's a sandwich where you don't have to do dishes or cut anything. Um, I ate a lot of salad sandwiches and I ate a lot of every type of sandwich imaginable. Um, but the reason I could do that is because on my trip, I stayed with 68 different families and almost all of them cooked more than one homemade meal. So I would be super lazy on the road because it's like just just like oh, I would I, do I rather would I rather cut vegetables and do dishes and eat a warm meal or would I rather just eat a sandwich and go to bed and it was always just go to bed but then I got taken care of with with real meals from from folks along the way but I would eat when I was hungry I'd camp when I was tired again I didn't have a plan for where I was camping I would just be on the side of the road here's my tent hidden behind this little shrub and then there's the road right there and I've, I've done all my bike touring like this. It kind of seems, seems wild when people first hear about it, but it's, it's actually really awesome. And I think one of the greatest, it was one of the greatest experiences I had as far as understanding what the monarchs are going through, right? So on the monarch migration, the monarchs are flying north in the spring and every day they're progressing and every night they have to rest somewhere. And every single year there's less places for them to do that there's less places for them to eat there's less places for them to rest every year more and more of the prairie more and more of their habitat is developed into something that that's that's not there that's not for them and so i could kind of begin to empathize a little bit with that because i was doing the same thing i was biking and when there was lots of public land or wild lands it was easy to find a camp spot but when it would start to get more developed, it would become harder and harder. And some nights I'd have to pedal an extra two hours looking for a place. And so I really understand why it's so important from like this, this personal level, why it's so important to have, um, they're often called way stations or, or refuges in, on the entirety of their route. We can't just protect where they go in the summer and just in the winter. We have to protect everywhere in between, which is the case for all migrants. Um, now, um, best thing about camping, super easy to clean your house. 
my house is always clean when I bike to work. Never, never any other time. <laughs> but um, again, so much freedom. Just like I camped on this. This was on one of the Great Lakes. I forget which one. Huron. I'm gonna say Huron. I actually like dragged my bike for like I don't know a quarter mile through the woods. The mosquitoes were thick. It was actually terrible. But this is one of my favorite camp spots on the trip. And free. I never, I never paid to camp. Um, other great thing about bike touring is you meet people. And if you are, if you're in a plane or a train or a car, you're not going to have as many of these interactions. But because I was vulnerable on the road, because I was going slow, I actually needed these interactions. I needed to ask people directions. I needed to ask for water. I needed to ask for food. And then, of course, I'm going slow enough that people are like, it's I'm more approachable. I'm, I'm less it's easier to talk to me. So this guy stopped me in the middle of nowhere, Mexico. It was like, I mean, it, it was at least 100 degrees out, out. I was beyond bored on the side of this road, just like slogging along, trying to trying to get somewhere. And he shows up and, you know, of course, you're, at first you're like, oh gosh, what does this guy want? And then he's like, hey, do you want some ice cream? And this happened over and over again. And my rule was always, as long as I felt safe, try and say yes say yes say yes say yes because that's where the that's where the stories are right I don't honestly remember much about the miles before or after but I remember this experience vividly and that ice cream was amazing and I yeah I'm just I'm so grateful for these interactions this this is where the story is is in in the moments like this but it wasn't just like these impromptu moments like I was saying I stayed with 68 families on my trip most of them found out about me usually through like a friend of a friend or one of the things I did is I would send a lot of press releases out and then I'd get an article written up, up in the newspaper and then that would get forwarded to someone who loves monarchs and then they would tell their friends on Facebook and then all of a sudden I'd have an email and sometimes it was like the connections just got so convoluted and deep I'm looked like people are like how do you know each other and I'm like the monarch <laughs> it's like the monarchs connect us I don't know any other way to describe it but this, this was one of my experiences. This was actually a friend of a friend. Um, and she emailed me and she said, oh, I found out about you from Sydney. And um, do you want to stay at my farm? And I was like, yeah, of course I want to stay at a farm. She lives in Ontario uh, in Canada. And what I love about this picture is she invited me to have, she, she, she lived on a dairy farm, worked on a dairy farm. And she invited me to have chocolate ice cream homemade from her dairy cows and I was like oh, man it's worth every mile to get here and and so in the foreground of this picture Margaret is feeding me homemade ice cream thank you Margaret but I love again the connection that I kind of forged with the monarch which is because in the background who is Margaret feeding but other pollinators monarchs included and what I found with those 68 families is the majority of them had a butterfly garden of some sort because they were fans of monarchs and so they were like literally the monarchs and I were like probably going to the same places and just being like so happy like the monarchs are in the back eating their their nectar and their caterpillars are grubbing on milkweed and I'm in the kitchen gorging on whatever and again I just I love the idea that the monarchs and I found the the same houses to be the best houses on, on our trip so that, that was a, an important part and then the last, the last thing that I really love about bike touring is just all the little things that you find along the way, things you could never plan. So when you leave on a bike tour or, or any type of trip, really, you don't, you can't, ex you can't expect a certain weird thing to happen, but you can expect weird things to happen. Or you can't expect to find a specific animal often, but you can expect to find interesting animals. And so as much as my book is about butterflies, it really is about all the animals on, on, our, on our planet that we share our home with. And this was a little toadlet that was hopping across the road. I guarantee if you were at a car, you probably wouldn't have noticed him. Or if you had, by the time you'd like found a pull out and like stopped and thought about walking back, the moment would have been, been passed. So on a bike, it's great. You just like, it's easy to stop, it's easy to check things out and it's easy to notice and you're going that perfect speed. I've done a lot of walking, but walking you're going, like sometimes it can be overwhelming to look at a map because you're like, oh my gosh, like that's a long way. But on a bike, you can go pretty fast, but not too fast. And you can find all sorts of things. And like Julie said, I um, do amphibian work in the summers 
And so frogs are are my my joy. I they're they're my favorite creature on the planet, and I I love them so much. So so by traveling with monarchs, I was able to travel with frogs too. The, just to, toads don't migrate like monarchs do. They would it would have made a, a very short anticlimactic migration route on a bike. Now most of, my trip was like kind of half and half. It was like um it wasn't always like this but there was a lot a lot of miles of me biking along great habitat and so you can see in this picture this is me i'm like literally in the process of jumping off my bike because i have just spotted this milkweed here it's a common milkweed and if you squint you might be able to make out this um fifth instar monarch caterpillar and i got really good i biked my trip was 10,201 miles and I got by like mile 5,000, I was really, really good at spotting monarchs on milkweed while biking about 10 miles an hour. And there's like a few telltale signs. In this case, I actually, I can't remember specifically what my mind first saw, but the frass, which is caterpillar poo, it's actually a lot more obvious than the caterpillars when they're, when they're big like this even. So I, was, I probably cued into the caterpillar frass first um, before I spotted the monarch. But I probably spent like an hour in this ditch. And I like, I mean, it sounds a little weird, but like, I, I feel like I've made friends with all these guys, like just spending time with them. And so this was such a huge part of my trip. And I, I trained my eyes to see the world like a monarch. But then the, the, the flip side of that was I, I could get really depressed and really sad by spending the other half of my time biking by by this scenario, which was knowing that a bunch of caterpillars and a bunch of butterflies and a bunch of snakes and frogs and creatures were living in this this land next to the road and now it's being mowed down. And <laughs> it hurt. Like it hurts to like make friends with a butterfly and spend nine months of your life with them and to pedal mile after mile on land that just can't cut them up, can't, can't share, can't, can't cut them in on it at all. And it wasn't just the side of the road, it was everywhere. And it, I guarantee that if you start to look, when you go on walks or on drives, start to look at all the land that used to be for natives, native plants, native animals, and, and now is green grass, your mind will, <laughs> your mind will start to explode because it's everywhere. And here's the thing, like, right, we know that the reason people are planting these grass lawns, or in this case, this is just a monoculture cornfield with a green grass border, is like, we're trying to be neighbors, right? We've decided that what is beautiful is this perfectly green grass that we mow, and then we water, and then we fertilize and probably spray with herbicides and pesticides. Like, we're, we, we think we're doing this to be a good neighbor, but I think it's it's so important for us to remember that we're neighbors to more than humans and that we need to be good neighbors to, to our butterfly neighbors and our frog neighbors and our bird neighbors. And this isn't how we do it. So what we need to do is change how, how, we, how we use the planet and we need to start sharing. And so a lot of the message really of my trip, this, what I spent the most time talking about is we, ha we have to return the prairie to native. We have to share our yards with native plants and native animals. So if you could imagine, if you take half of all these lawns and you return them to prairie, well, then the monarchs are gonna have a fighting chance. And here's, here's just what the stakes are right now. This is a graph of the monarch population and it doesn't, the numbers don't really matter. All that really matters to me that, that people recognize is this downward trend. So the, the bigger the, the, the bar, the more monarchs there were, and you can see over time that number is decreasing. And eventually we're going to hit zero, which means there, there's going to still be monarchs in other parts of the world, but they won't be, mi they won't be migratory. They won't do this overwintering, this, this multinational, multi-generational migration. Um, it, it will be gone. And the reason that the, there's this decline is because of habitat loss, primarily habitat loss and climate change. And, and so we all have a, a role to play. And that's, I think, one of the main, most important reasons like that, that I think the monarch is a great spokes, spokesman for the environment, for the planet. And I think it's one of the reasons that my bike tour was so successful is because unlike so many animals we hear about in the news that they feel far off, they feel like 
well, we can, like our direct action, we, there's less direct action we can do. Like literally by planting native plants in your yard, you're going to help, you're going to help reverse this trend. And that's such a gift the monarchs give us. This is like, the world feels so overwhelming sometimes, right? Like the news is like, it just hits hard a lot. So to be able to like go into your own yard and plant some native plants, it's like, it's so concrete, it's, it's so achievable and it's and the there's going to be results and and it will actually help the monarchs and it's not going to just help monarchs like i was like i was saying it's going to help all the animals that rely on that habitat so this is this is this is bad but at the same time there's a solution which is really empowering in in 2021 again now since we're at bend i'll throw in another graph here just for folks that are interested this is the western monarch population and you can see the trend down is even more and in fact last year you can see 2020 um, the counts didn't even register on this graph there was about 2,000 counted again this is it's it's not it's interesting because um, there's still monarchs in California especially they're just because of climate change they're not doing that thing where they clump in the trees as much and become sexually um, inactive sexual it's called sexual diapause they're not they're not pausing their breeding to overwinter they're just becoming year-round migrant or year-round resident monarchs so they're still monarchs but they're not doing this overwintering which is what we're noticing the trend downward of luckily like i was saying everyone can help and and i truly believe that everyone can and i don't own land i've planted some milkweed at my parents house and and you know when i'm staying at a house or renting a house, I'll, I'll plant milkweed there, but I, I can't kind of nurture that land like someone can that own, owns some land. But I do have my voice, like I was saying. And on the course of my bike tour, I spoke to about 9,000 people about the Monarch. And it was mostly school kids. And my favorite line in my presentation was, I did not see a Monarch every day, but every day I saw the people that could help the Monarch. And literally every single person I saw on my bike ride could help. And I think that again, it, it's so empowering and it's so wonderful. And it it was it was medicine for me to to do those presentations. Because like I said, like it was often my trip was like half total anger that the world had mowed down the monarch habitat and that we had planted so much GMO corn that was getting sprayed with herbicides so the milk we couldn't make it. And then and then I'd go to a school and I just have this great sense of hope. And so what I wanna do is go through a few of the, the places that gave me a lot of hope. I think it's, it's important to remember these places in the midst of all the chaos. Um, and I call these places often my medicine because it, it, was, it was the hardest part of my trip was not the miles. It was like the, the psychological, like I had too much time to think. And uh, yeah, so. This is one of the first or one of the places that they gave me a lot of medicine, like I was saying at schools. And in particular, this was a school garden. This was a garden in Omaha. I, I think that there should be a school garden at every school in the world, but um, we could start in North America. And it's because not only was this like a, a scientific laboratory, it was teaching these kids that they have a responsibility to the land and that they have an effect on the land. Like if they plant these milkweed, and they're helping the monarchs and it was so beautiful and we spent an afternoon outside looking for eggs and when a, a monarch flew over our heads it was like one of the most magical things that's ever happened just all of us just all of us were like screaming with joy <laughs> and i know like that monarch wouldn't have wouldn't have been there if there hadn't been that 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 garden and so i love that those kids got to see like firsthand like if you do stuff if you help the planet then the planet's going to return all these gifts of beauty and joy and wonderment and excitement to you. And so, yeah, find a school, help plant a garden. I also found a lot of medicine at, at wildlife refuges, any, any public land, any land that I knew wasn't going to be developed next year. has always made me um, really, really happy. And I, I kind of, I treated these refuges like a lot of migrants do which is they kind of hop between them most migrants can't make it and i couldn't either make it from one refuge to another each night so we really need to supplement all of these 
these wildlife refuges and national parks and state parks and public lands with our with our own yards. And then there were farmers. I met some really incredible farmers just thinking differently about about how we grow food on our land. Um, in this case, this is Bill. He's he works or he started Native American Seed in Junction, Texas. He doesn't grow food, well, not for humans, um, but he started his career planting Bermuda grass, and like, and this was in the 80s, and he was just like, "What am I doing? Like, why am I helping people landscape with a plant that they have to water and fertilize and mow and all this stuff?" And so he started using natives, and that blossomed into his farm. I actually stayed on their farm twice as well. It was so wonderful. Um, never will I forget biking down the road and seeing rows of antelope horn milkweed, like this this plant that like wants to be wild, being planted in rows. And the reason they did that was because they were trying to harvest as many seeds as they could and then sell the seeds so that more Texans could return prairie to their yards and schools and, and wherever there was places for, for that to happen. Um, and then, like I've been saying a lot, I found so much medicine and so much hope in all the gardens that I came across on my trip. I, like I said, stayed with a lot of people and saw a lot of different gardens. One of my favorites, this is Amy's Garden in Tulsa, Oklahoma. And what I love about it is because it's such a good example of sharing. She's got some grass for the dog and kids, she's got her patio, and then she has these ornamentals mixed in with natives, and she's got a bunch of common milkweed here. And at first you're like, okay, that's, that's a little something, I guess, okay. But she told me that she'd already found 40 eggs on this milkweed. And so if only, if even only one of those eggs survives, that's 500 more eggs in the next generation. And if just a few of those survive, that's a thousand eggs in the next generation. And so it really does add up. And what I love is, is that there's just like this small, tiny little chance that like I stayed at Amy's house and one of those eggs, like I saw them later in New York, not them, but I saw like maybe their, their mom or, or daughter, I guess it would be daughter or great granddaughter. Um, or even great great granddaughter in Mexico. And I, I just love that, like, maybe there were monarchs that I saw that exist only because of this garden. And that's wonderful. Now, the first step is a small little garden in your backyard, I think. But I don't want anyone to just think that that's where it has to end. And this is a great example. This is Nadia's garden in Columbia, Missouri. And I, I love this garden so much. It was like one of those things where Nadia could have just told me the street. And she didn't need to tell me an address because of like biking down the road and you see all the milkweed in the, oops, all the milkweed in the front yard. And you're like, yep, yep, this is where I'm supposed to be. But what I love about Nadia's garden is one, it's in the front yard. We need to, again, change what we think beauty is. We need to change what it is to be a good neighbor. And so if we can lead by example, if there can be someone like Nadia on every street and every city and every state, like showing the world a different way, that's great because what happens is that idea spreads. So if you look over at Nadia's neighbors, there's a milkweed. And I asked her about it and she said, yeah, well, before the neighbors just mowed everything, but then they found out if there's no milkweed, there's no monarchs. So they started mowing around this little clump of milkweed. And how beautiful is that? Like if our ideas are gonna spread, the milkweed's gonna spread, like we, we can do this. It just takes having examples to like start the ripple. And it doesn't matter where you live. This is the monarch I saw in New York City. And so on, if, you, if, a, if a monarch could live in New York City, like I could barely live in New York City, then it's possible anywhere we are. And if you'll, and if you'll indulge me for a moment, um, this is a, a picture of the monarchs in Mexico, like I was saying, they overwinter um, and they form these clumps in the trees. And you can see, if you look at this one tree here, it's, it's not a big tree, but it's bending from the weight of monarchs. And this is a really small tree, but it's kind of the best photo I had to showcase what I want to say. But it takes about four monarchs to equal the weight of a dime. And there'll be so many monarchs on the branches that they can break substantially substantial branches from just from their collective weight. And so I'm looking at this picture and I've just been talking a lot about small gardens and small efforts. But I think it's so valuable to remember that, that we are just like the monarchs. Like, 
one monarch in this forest can't would probably not even move a, a needle of the tree. And just like us, one garden isn't going to make a big difference. But when we all do a little bit, when we all plant a small garden somewhere, anywhere, then we can metaphorically bend branches. And the same goes with our voices too. This is what happens in Mexico when the sun comes out in February and March. And this is one of the best times to, to visit because you can go there and you can close your eyes and you can literally hear millions of monarchs flapping their wings. And so it's the same, it's the same idea, right? One butterfly, I can't hear. My hearing's not that good for, I, I, would, I would miss it. But when a million are flying together, it's impossible to ignore. It's this most beautiful hum. And so like my voice alone, I'm just one, one lady out there like yelling from the mountaintops, plant milkweed, plant milkweed. But if, if ever, all of you tonight go home and tell someone and they tell someone and we tell our neighbors and we tell our families and our friends, like our voices will expand and grow and be unstoppable. So think about the monarchs, um, they need our help. And in return, they're gonna thank us. And I think one of the things that I was not expecting and that I've, I think I've even kind of come to realize after writing my book and even just talking about my experience of writing and, and writing um, is how the monarchs are these wonderful guides and teachers. And what I, basically what I wanna say is, look how beautiful they are. It's so easy to fall in love with a butterfly, but I think what makes the monarchs special is that they invite us into this world that is often overlooked. And so we fall in love with the beautiful monarch butterfly. And then we're like, I wanna learn about the caterpillars. So you, you can't go fast. You have to stop. You have to practically crawl around and you'll start to find their caterpillars. This is what gives the milkweed their name milkweed because it looks like milk. It's not milk, it's poison and it's sticky. It actually will glue shut the mouths of young caterpillars. Very, very cool relationship monarchs and milkweed have. But anyway, you're gonna to start to look for all these little secrets, I call them. And you're gonna to start to discover the tussock moths that also need milkweed. And they have a really amazing ecology story too. The, they, they will um, become moths and moths obviously fly around at night most of the time. And so if you were a bright orange moth to warn predators, that wouldn't really work, right? It's dark. So um, these moths will actually, as adults, they'll develop, a, they have like a clicking sound and it's the clicking is the warning rather than the bright orange, we call it aposomatic coloring. It's aposomatic sound to warn bats and other creatures like, hey, we're poisonous. So cool, I digress. You'll also discover all the, the, the other animals in the milkweed. This again is common milkweed here. You can see the hairs on this milkweed, maybe barely. The monarchs will actually shave those hairs often. They'll actually cut each one or bite off each one to allow better access to the flesh of the leaf. Um, the hairs are also on the spider. And one of the things I think is really important to note is that each female monarch is going to lay between three and 500 eggs typically. And they're gonna to wanna to lay one egg per plant. That way the egg or the caterpillar as it's developing will have plenty of, of food. If they laid all of their eggs on one milkweed, they'd run out of food quickly. But it's important to remember three to 500, if all of them survived, we would be inundated with monarchs. There'd be too many. So what we need is to have enough milkweed that each egg has a fighting chance. But then we need to also accept that a lot of them are gonna get eaten by spiders and ants and wasps and beetles and that that's okay. Like, because they're all part of the food chain and the monarchs are, get, are, are giving us this gift of all these little packets of food that are gonna help help the, the ecosystem so that we have birds and butterflies and um, help what are other animals, frogs, snakes. <laughs> so it's, it's just all linked, it's all important. And then you're gonna, um, as you're exploring, you're gonna start to notice all the other pollinators. This is a hummingbird moth, I blew my mind. <laughs> That's a moth. And then of course, there's also the frogs. This is a little froglet in a common milkweed leaf. And so I think it's so important to remember that it, that the monarchs might be your passion and they might not be, but that doesn't really matter. What matters is that you find the animal or the plant that speaks to you. And then you go out and you give your time and energy and voice to that creature. Because when you help frogs, you're helping monarchs. And when you're helping monarchs, look here, you're helping frogs. So everyone is is connected. And, and so I think to end, I'd just like to say like, you don't have to quit your job, buy a crummy beat up bike and bike through Mexico 
or brave New York City or get attacked by crazy, scary creatures on the side of the road in Canada. This skunk and I had a misunderstanding, <laughs> but we both came out okay. Um, I actually claim this to be one of the, the cutest animals of the trip. Look at that little nose. Um, you don't have to do any of that. All you have to do is plant milkweed. And if you plant milkweed, I guarantee that the true adventurer, because the true adventure is not me in the story, right? Like I needed maps and grocery stores and 68 people and the media. I needed so much. The monarchs, they just need your garden. Um, if you plant that garden, the, the true adventures will come to you. And boy, it's, it's just, it's such an adventure to plant a garden, to, to be, to be a, on the team helping the monarchs. I'm, I'm so grateful. So you can definitely um, check out my book, Bicycling with Butterflies, if you want more stories, or um, you can also look on my website, beyondabook.org. I've got lots of photos. Um, and before, let's see, one time. Looks like, I think, we have, I think we have enough time that I am going to read two paragraphs, if you will. It is a book. We're at a bookshop talking about books. I got to read some book, but I'm not going to read any part of the pages. I'm actually going to read from the acknowledgments. And I, I love the acknowledgment section. It's, I think it's my favorite one because it, I, I like had um, a conversation with a publisher and I was like, I have to list everyone that helped me on my trip. I mean, I couldn't list everyone. A lot of people, I didn't even know their names, but like all the people I stayed with, all the people that helped organize presentations, like this was a solo bike tour, but I was with millions of monarchs and I, it was thanks to thousands of people. So I fought very hard for the acknowledgements to be as long as it is. And I think the last two paragraphs sum it up nicely. So here we go. Thanks to everyone fighting in endlessly big and small ways on behalf of the monarchs and their neighbors. Our paths may not have crossed, but your efforts are seen, felt, and appreciated. Biking past an unmowed ditch or a lawn devoted to natives will always make me hoot with joy. And finally, with all my heart and soul, thanks to the monarchs, you amaze me. You have become my teachers, encouraging an adventure, teaching me Spanish, watercolor, web design, video editing, photography, networking, public speaking, gardening, stewardship, science, and love. You helped me write this book and every word of it is for you. So that's Bicycling with Butterflies. Um, I will turn off the screen share. And if anyone has uh, questions, I'm happy, happy to answer them. Excellent. Thank you so much. That was so great to see all of those pictures, to see all of the butterflies. Um, yes, if you have questions, um, you can either use the raise hand function and I can unmute you. You can type it into the chat screen. Um, <clears throat> Sarah, really quick, I wanted to ask, in addition to milkweed, are there other plants that are um, very good for monarchs and maybe very good for like bees and other pollinators? Right. Yeah, great question. So the monarchs, they have to have milkweed, but they also need to have lots of other plants to drink nectar. And, and monarch adults are not very, they're, they're generalists. They don't have like one specific plant, but in general, I just recommend folks plant natives because the natives have been around for thousands of years, as have the monarchs and the bees and the and the birds. So they've developed relationships with these plants. And so my my advice is always plant three or four different species. Start small if because it can be overwhelming. See which ones take, see which ones don't. Often it's a matter of where do you live, what's the soil, what's the what, what's the um, the sun conditions or the drainage or whatever. So plant some, see which work. And I guarantee if they're natives and they bloom, the bees and the butterflies will both benefit and everyone will be happy. Excellent. So we've got one question in the chat and then a raised hand. So let's do the chat really quick. Um, the question is what gives you the most hope for monarchs? What gives me the most hope is that there are, I mean, hundreds of thousands of people that, that care enough to, to give their time and energy to the monarchs. I, I, I did not have any idea how much the monarch was a, was a part of people's lives before I started. And it became very apparent at every presentation I gave, just 
the level of excitement and, and dedication and passion. And, and that's impossible to, to discount. And I think mm -hmm. that the reason we have any monarchs left today is because people cared and they're fighting. So I, I guess, yeah, I, I have hope because a lot of people care. This is not something that can be won with just a couple, a couple of passionate people. It's literally gonna take all of us. Yeah. So Thanks. Jen, uh, let's go ahead. I'm gonna unmute you so you can do that. Go ahead and ask your question. Sure. I just want to say thank you for going on this journey and uh, sharing it with all of us. Um, my mom and I have started reading books together during COVID as kind of like a uh, mom-daughter book club. And so we read this one and it was really exciting. And uh, my mom's here on the call with us. You want to wave, mom? <laughs> um, mom? And she had, she planted, after this, she planted several milkweed plants in her garden. And actually, you know, like we were both just ecstatic when she got her first caterpillar on the milkweed plant and um, so yeah I just wanted to say thank you so much for doing that and sharing this with all of us um, and we plan to plant a lot of milkweed in our backyard here in Bend it's a little harder to get it to grow here but I think we can we can do it um, but I remember in the book you were talking about if you were to plant um, like the seedlings you really recommended one type versus another um I mean I know the one that is based on our climate um but I remember you saying one that was maybe like not pesticide free but something free oh yeah Do you right so when, when you're looking for like milkweed starts it's good to mm -hmm. make sure that they're they're pesticide it's pesticide free that's neonicotoids neonic uh, that's what it is uh -huh. um, the, the neonicotoids, they often coat the seeds and it's water soluble. And so what happens is once you plant the seed, then that it, it like releases that, that poison and then it's uptake, it's taken up by the roots and it's put into the shoots and into the pollen and into the flower. And so for at least the first few years of that plant's life, it's gonna be toxic to all of mm -hmm. everyone. So yeah, mm -hmm. I recommend looking for any, any native nursery is going to have um, organic plants and um yeah if anyone on here knows of a great place in bend or if, if you do jen um to get native plants you should tell tell everybody yeah please do throw it in the chat if anybody knows i would be curious where a good place in bend is to get this so thank you so much yeah thank you that mean, means a lot makes the miles worth it um there is also the xerces society has the milkweed it's either a milkweed mapper or milkweed finder um, and they'll, they have lots of links to native, um, nurseries, sorry, I blanked for a second. So let's see here. We've got a couple other questions. Um, Polly's wondering how do other butterfly species differ from monarchs? Hmm. Right. So every species of butterfly has a different strategy for for a lot of things, but I, I think one of the biggest differences is overwintering. Mm. So a lot of a lot of butterflies um, will either overwinter as an egg. So that's why it's important to keep some of your your leaf compost in the backyard. Um, they'll also overwinter as as larvae sometimes, as caterpillars, and then also as pupa, or the chrysalis, or the for the case of a moth, um, but the pupa and um, so the cocoon is, I couldn't kind of come up with it for a second, cocoon or chrysalis. And so they'll overwinter all, they'll spend all winter in, as, as that life stage. The monarch is different because they don't do that. Instead, they fly all the way to Mexico. And it's a really amazing story. They fly all the way to Mexico because Mexico has this, per, where, where they overwinter is this perfect temperature of not too hot, not too cold. So mm -hmm. the place in Mexico where they go is about 10,000 feet above sea level. So it's, it's pretty safe from the extreme weather that we get here in, in the United States and Canada of like extreme cold, extreme freezing. Um, but it's not so cold that they're active all year because monarchs are cold blooded, right? So if a monarch is flying around all winter, they're gonna use a lot of energy. But their goal is to, when they get to Me Mexico is to actually not use any, any energy at all. So it's that perfect temperature where they're basically just hanging there, just like waiting. It's kind of like, almost like a hibernation. Um, and not a, not a lot of species do that. Um, there's there's other differences as far as like host plants. Every every butterfly has usually has a different host plant. Some are more generalist than others. Um, 
yeah, lots of differences, lots of similarities. I think I think that's one of the great things like that I learned while I was biking is this book is about monarchs, but like honestly, you could write a book about every single creature in your backyard because there's going to be a little secret, a little something that like kind of blows your mind for every single animal. It's just a matter of getting to know them and and taking the time to pay attention. So we have a couple of comments um, about where to find uh, milkweed. So oh, good. first of all, Jana, who I believe is with the Deschutes Land Trust, um, has thrown up a link that I will put in uh, the information when I post this to YouTube so that people can see it, but you can get native milkweed seeds from Deschutes Land Trust. So um, if you go to their website, it looks like it might be under their About Us. Um, a couple people posted too, and this was the thought that I had, but I've not used them before, is uh, Winter Creek Nursery on Deschutes Market Road um, is really good for native plants. I've heard a lot of people talk about it earlier this spring. Um, you can go and pick out your plants early and they will keep them as starts and let them grow before you can actually put them in the ground. Because as we all know here, if there's still frost on one of the sisters, you don't plant in central Oregon. Um, so that's really cool to think we could keep it really hyper local with Winter Creek and Deschutes Land Trust. So that's so awesome um, that both of those are available. There was a really cool comment that I wanna read really quick. Um, I'm going to say her name is Sharon. Just wanted you to know that my brother-in-law is a docent at the Phoenix Botanical Gardens Butterfly Pavilion. I told my sister about your book. She bought him a copy. She bought me a copy. And now my brother-in-law has managed to get the botanical gardens to have lots of your books for sale. That's so cool. Yay. Thank you. That's so awesome. Thank you. Yes. It's so um, amazing, just so sorry to interrupt, but what, one of my favorite things is about how the monarchs truly connect us all. And I just love that there's all these, these little connections happening with my book and with people and people are becoming friends because they are all going and planting milkweed at the same time. I just think it's, it's so wonderful to see all those connections and yeah, thank, thanks for helping spread the word. Yeah, so cool. Well, um, this is funny. Our store owner is, is on the event right now. Hi, Cassie. Um, so a really quick one, hopefully, um, cause we've got about, you know, five minutes or so left. Um, she's wondering about some of the other experiences you, uh, had being out there. Uh, she says, for example, the Missouri river experience, uh, other cycling and what inspired you to adventure. Yeah, I started, going on bicycle adventures when I was like eight or something, you know, not nothing big. Like I thought I was so cool because I could ride my bike to Walmart and Walmart was two miles away. And I'd like, like be like, oh man, I made it to Walmart. And I'd like get a little Walmart bag and tie it around my handlebars and be like, look, I made it to Walmart. <laughs> There's a busy street. But I think there was something in that. There was something about like being able, like it was, it's addicting to, to know that you can use your own power to get where you want to go. And so I just kept biking. I did my first bike tour in high school on the East Coast. Um, and then I went to college. I went to Humboldt State in Northern California. And all of like my entire world was based around biking and based around like, we'd go to city council meetings and advocate for bike infrastructure. We'd throw, we'd throw parties where we'd bike to the top of a hill and then go back down like everything was about bikes and so our thanksgivings were occupied with bike touring our spring breaks were occupied with bike touring and then a couple of my friends and I after we graduated um we made a pact that we were going to go on a long bike tour and about a year later my friend calls and he said I want to bike to every state and so we said okay and and that's kind of where it really started is we decided we were going to bike to every state in the United States and knowing that it was going to be about a year long trip, I just knew we were going to get like antsy, like almost like bored, almost like tetherless. So I, I suggested we do presentations to schools, which was like, in retrospect, amazing and like ridiculous that we thought we could do it. And like, because none of us had any experience teaching, none of us had like really done any public speaking other than like city council meetings or whatever. And those first presentations <laughs> that we did were so bad. Like one of them, I remember we had nothing to say. We'd only gone like a hundred miles or whatever. We're like having all the kids stretch because we were just like, I don't know what to talk about. But 
we got we we just kept going and we just like learned as we went and I think that's like one of the most valuable lessons that biking has taught me is just like just keep going learn as you go it's okay to mess up and and that trip was transformational and we just all fell in love with it and so I just kept trying to do do trips like that and I would just I would just try and come up with unique unique ways to travel to see the world and then try and pair it with school so like you said I, I can do the Missouri River from source to sea and did trips and rode my bike from Bolivia to Texas with a friend um, I'm currently trying to do a canoe trip in Ecuador and I just got word today that our permit was denied but we have bought tickets <laughs> so here we go <laughs> I don't I'm like kind of stressing about it but I'm also trying to take my own advice which is like, just go with it. It's going to be okay. So it's like, it's, I'm like, it's good to be a little scared and I'm a little scared, but hope, hopefully something comes from it. Yeah. Um, will we see another book from you? <laughs> I, I hope so. I'm actually, I've been in my homework the last month or so after my frog job has ended was I'm trying to write a book, the same book, but for eight to 12 year olds. Oh. So that's kind of my, the next big goal of mine trying to not make it boring for an eight-year-old <laughs> and it's like when I started my trip my audience my target audience was like fifth graders I love fifth graders I think they are so incredibly creative and inspiring and interested in the whole world and they haven't decided that there's one way to live yet so I think mm -hmm. it's such a great age to talk to and so yeah that's that's my goal right now is to to write to them that's amazing. Um, when that happens, we'll definitely have to have you back. And we have lots of elementary schools right within walking distance of roundabout. So we could definitely uh, connect you with some elementary and middle schools. I think that would be amazing. Yeah, that would be fun. Yeah, yeah lots of potential. So um, let's see here. Jana did throw in the chat, the chat, excuse me, that there is another nursery, Clearwater Native Plant Nursery here in Redmond also has milkweed. So, um, but obviously the other one on Deschutes Market is accessible by everyone. I take that road home sometimes. Um, so that's so, yeah, I'm excited. I know we're going into like the cold season, but it's uh, cool to think we could start planting some milkweed in the spring and um, get monarchs in our backyards. That would be very cool. Yeah, and all sorts of other pollinators. Yeah, yeah. And my birds aunt, and frogs. Uh, my aunt plants a lot of bee balm. So we get a lot of hummingbirds at her house and that kind of stuff and the bees, obviously. So, well, this has been so great. Thank you so much to everyone who was here tonight, who uh, asked questions and just generally supported this author and our bookstore and books in general. I just want to remind everyone we have copies of the books uh, at the store. This is going to be a great holiday gift. So please uh, get it now. And again, get your holiday shopping done early. Ask your local indie bookstore for any recommendation. They are there to help you and they like helping you. <laughs> All right. Well, Sarah, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Um, we'll sign off for now. Everyone, please, uh, we would be happy to see you at the store and on our next Zoom uh, book event. So everyone have a great evening and a wonderful weekend. Thank you. All right.